But uh, I want to move back to NLP for a moment as well. We, we had a number of questions from our Robin Lee community when they hear that we were interviewing you today. So I have some more like technical depth um, questions. So as you know, synta syntactic parsing was used in many feature-based methods. Now the trend is that it has been used less in feature engineering work, but more on the end-to-end -end system. So how do you see the future of research in syntactic parsing? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question, right. and also in some sense one I can feel a little awkward on because, yeah, absolutely what the question says is right, um, that um, for really nearly all of NLP history, it's seen, been seen as foundational that something that you need to be able to do is work out the structure of a sentence as a syntactic parse, and that would be a basis in which to understand and interpret the sentence and having that would help you do other things like machine translation and lots of um, NLP researchers including me have spent lots of time working on better ways of parsing sentences and the truth is that looking forward for many tasks it's not clear that that's going to be directly useful that we've now seen this generation of deep learning systems where people have got some end tasks, whether it's question answering or machine translation, and that you're training large neural network models with no explicit training on syntactic structure, and they work great, better than anything we had before. So you could um, fear that all of that um, research um, on doing syntactic parsing um, perhaps was misguided. Um, right. And here are, <laughs> here are a couple of thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, one thought is that if you have a task where there's a huge amount of data, then I think it is true now that you can train a model end-to-end -end with no explicit syntactic structure and it will do very well. Um, but there are sort of two things there are then two things that go in the opposite direction. The first one is, well, why does it do very well? And actually something I've been working on recently with a, um, a new student, John Hewitt, is looking at some of these deep contextual language models like Elmo and Bert, which are trained on humongous amounts of um, textual data with no knowledge of syntactic structure. And the truth is that we've been able to show quite convincingly that actually models like Elmo and Bert are learning syntactic structure, that they're trained on enough billions of words of text, that they start to see the patterns and understand the utility of the patterns and actually have syntactic structure in the models that they're learning, that they're just inducing automatically. So in, sense, in some sense, these models are proving that what linguists say about syntax is approximately right, right? right. They're recognizing the kind of structure of sentences and understanding what's a relative clause uh, is actually important to be able to predict with language and these models learn that syntactic structure. So there will be still be syntactic structure. It might just be we're having the models learn it autonomously. And in some sense, that's progress, because surely it's better if we can just do this machine learning and we'll probably end up with richer representations than humans that are sort of hand designing um, symbolic structures. But the flip side is that that only works when you are training on enormous, enormous amounts of text. And so I think there are going to remain lots of other places where you're not in a situation where you can train on a billion words of text end to end. And then having syntactic structure is an extremely good prior that lets you make a lot of, gives you a very good scaffolding for understanding things, right? So like even today for one of the visual question answering talks that I was listening to, that they are aligning a scene graph of the visual scene um, with a dependency parse of sentences and showing how that gave value for doing um, quest visual question answering tasks because you're sort of doing this aligning between sentence structure and scene graph structure. And in any, almost in almost any place where you have a limited amount of training data, you get good value for making use of having extra information about what the structure of sentences are and how words relate to each other. So I think there are still very many places um, where explicit parsing and syntactic structure will continue to be used. And it sounds like there's also great opportunity for diversity of thought and how to pull, bring those together. Is yes, there absolutely. Well and welcomed and helps us mature out yeah, uh, absolutely. the research. Yeah. So in terms of in neural network-based NLP systems, how should we incorporate knowledge base? Um, that is also a good question, and um, it's, again, I think something that's not fully solved. I mean, the easy, 
The easy answer and perhaps the best answer at the moment is to say, well, as well as having textual data that we can learn from and refer to in doing other tasks, we can have a knowledge base that we can make use of in doing other tasks. And at the moment, the easiest way to realize that is to be able to have a model that puts attention over elements of a knowledge base. Attention has been a very successful technique in NLP in general. It's also used in things like neural machine translation. But for things um, like reasoning and accessing knowledge, um, attention has been a great idea. And so there's been a lot of work on having things like key value neural networks where you can look into a knowledge base using a key to look up information and get another value out of the knowledge base and bring it back in. Um, and that's a very successful technique. Um, at the end of the day, though, it still feels like there should be more because it seems like you should more directly be able to take knowledge and put it inside your neural network. And at the moment, I think we still don't have very good ways of doing that in the sense of saying, here's prior stuff we want to load the neural network with. So effectively, having this externalized knowledge that we have the neural network learn from or refer to as being the most successful method. Right. I think we could stay on that and talk for a long time and explore it further, but I'm going to finish on this question for you. Um, in terms of commercialization, where do you see the low-hanging fruits in natural language processing? And um, right. So I guess a lot of that um, depends on what area you're in right, right. and what you want to do and things like that. Um, you know, there are particular applications, obviously, for things like machine translation, where um, NLP in particular in recent years, Neural MT, have been super successful and work super well. Um, but that's um, an area which is only of interest to a limited range of companies. And I think, it's, you know, for more general use cases, I think there's no doubt at all that the most popular use case has been in the area of dialogue agents, right? That for many um, companies, interacting with customers is a huge cost um, or a huge opportunity that people, if there's other areas like trying to line up new customers, it's a huge opportunity that is insufficiently re realized because there aren't enough human beings doing it. And if some of this work can be done with dialogue agents for us, to, um, everything from lining up sales leads through to at the other end, um, dealing with um, customer support issues, that that's an enormous opportunity. And it's a place that's actually starting to succeed, right? Yeah. That um, building successful knowledge-rich dialogue agents is still quite difficult. Um, so there's nothing that has the expertise of a good human being. But on the other hand, there are lots of repeat questions and easy questions. And so to try and get to the point where you have a dialogue agent that can handle the easy 80% of questions or can do the first round of sort of customer acquisition, that that's an enormous appealing area, enormously appealing area, which is applicable across a wide range of companies. Right. And then if you were to add the computer vision aspect into that, is there an integration of computer vision and NLP in real life applications that you're seeing now that excites you about what's to come? Uh, if I'm honest, I think not so much in commercial applications, because right, right. it feels like the clear commercial applications at the moment tend to be more disjoint because the clear commercial applications for vision are things like um, sort of doing any kind of imaging analysis to find right. things in it and things like that. I mean, there are clearly places where um, vision and language go together um, that you're, um, whether it's sort of um, looking at things with your phone camera and then getting descriptions of what you see. Um, there's sort of been discussion of work to help blind people in, in ways like that, or it can just be used sort of to help a tourist um, to sort of tell them about what's going on. You know, so there are sort of nice applications that combine vision and language. I'm not sure there's really a kind of a, a clear commercial killer application at the mo that's emerged at the moment. Not yet anyway. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for being with us here today at CVPR. Thank you so much for your time. We really enjoyed this discussion. No thank problem. You. It's been fun talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.